I have promised, as I have promised, uh, after watching in the weekend a state-funded documentary called Fire and Fury. And Fire and Fury is a documentary made with the assistance of the Public Interest Journalism Fund to, I understand, though some say $300,000, $190,000. It was made by uh, Paula Penfold. I think the producer was Terence Taylor, both long-term uh, mainstream journalists. And it painted a picture, if you haven't seen it, it painted a picture of the protests at Parliament, which clearly linked those protests through a series of emotive editing techniques and dramatic music with Trumpism in the States, with QAnon, with fascism, with Nazism, with the far right. Um, it did not pointedly give any of the people that it criticised or identified as purveyors of fake news or false information or agent provocateurs, it gave none of those people interviews or a right of reply, which I thought for a work of taxpayer-funded journalism um, was a bit of a mistake. Uh, because if you don't give all sides of a story or attempt to, I guess you can rightly be accused of making a piece of propaganda. One of the people who featured prominently in the documentary but was not given uh, an interview and was not approached was a woman from Rangiora, I believe, uh, Chantelle Baker, whose dad, Leighton, was head of the new Conservative Party. And Chantelle, uh, Chantelle became something of an internet or Facebook sensation during the protest with her live streaming of what was going down on the uh, front lawn at Parliament and in the environs. In an attempt on behalf of the profession I've been part of uh, for nearly four dec decades, I thought it would be ro uh, the proper thing to do for someone to give Chantelle Baker a right of reply uh, to the taxpayer-funded um, Fire and Fury documentary, or was it Fury and Fire? Uh, so she joins us uh, now. Chantelle, thank you for joining us and welcome to the platform. Well, thanks for having me, Sean, nice and early. All right. Can I ask you first, for people who don't know who you are, who are you? What do you do for a day job? How did you end up at Parliament in the protest? Well, my job has always been more in sales and marketing, and I only started doing videos on social media talking about the lockdown about this time last year, actually. It's been nearly a year ago. And then ever since the beginning of the year, I've been doing this full time and traveling around New Zealand and telling the stories of the people and the effects that the lockdowns and the mandates have had on them and then just other interesting news pieces from around the country. So how I ended up at the convoy, it actually happened very quickly. So a lot a lot of people don't realise that this wasn't some huge pre-planned, very organised event that had been in the making for months and months. It was something that someone started very spontaneously as they watched what was happening in Canada. And it happened, I think, within about two weeks, people decided to convoy. So I put out that if people want to convoy, this is what's happening. And I was going to be live streaming the convoy up to Wellington. And back then, I had no idea that people were even planning to camp. I didn't actually realise people were even okay. wanting and in to what camp capacity, in Parliament. And in what capacity were you doing this? Were you being told to do it by someone else? Were you being paid to do it? Because presumably all this stuff costs money, Chantel. No, definitely not paid to do it <laughs> and definitely not told to do it. I just have a passion. I think that it's really exciting seeing people actually stand up for what they believe in and I think people need to be helped. And what I realised when I was watching what was going on is that the media were dehumanising people that went against the government. They were treating them like they were trash and they were calling them horrible, disgusting names and I thought they need someone to stand up and defend them, someone who's more balanced and reasonable that people can start to realise actually these, these people are not scum of the earth they just have a different opinion all right and you're saying you weren't formally or informally in contact with any group from overseas or any other group definitely not States? really no, I heard, I, no, I heard rumours towards the end of the protest that apparently people had been given money from the Canadian convoy, but as far as I know, that was complete rumours, because I don't know anyone that received any money from those groups, and no, I've never been in contact with any of them. Okay, what about Voices for Freedom? Were you, were you in contact with them? I've definitely talked with Voices for Freedom before, absolutely, yep. Um, what about these guys, what, what's his name? Um, 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 uh, Philip Arps. 
Damien Dement. Do, 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 do you know them? Did you talk to them? Philip Arms. I don't know uh, who Arps. that is. Sorry. sorry. No, Philip Al Arps. Calvin Alps. Sorry, Cal Calvin mean? Alps and Philip Arps. Yeah, Calvin <laughs> Alps. I get them. I get them confused. Calvin Alps. We in no, that's all right. I, I've. I mean, I've met them before. I've met them before. I met Calvin and his partner outside the High Court case because they were reporting on their platform, and I met them. And then I actually went away um, to go and watch the High Court, and then apparently he got arrested. I went back and asked his partner what had happened, and I walked her down to the police station because she was distraught. But I wouldn't say that I know them very well. I had no idea about Calvin's history. I have never been on the, the counterspin big shows. They've walked up to me before at protests and asked me to ask my opinion on a few things. Things, but yeah, very, very distantly know of them. And obviously, I mean, I, I watched the fire and fury. He said some pretty out there things. However, I still think that well, New Zealand out, what do you mean by out, out there, speak. Chantel? What do you mean by out there? Well, I think there was more violent, violent language spoken about, which as a lot of people know, I'm not a violent person. And I don't condone violence of any sort. So to me, that's out there. However, I know for a lot of people, they want to vent and they want to talk about how the last few years have impacted them. Some of them use violent language, but do they actually have any intention of acting on it? Not that I've seen. Well, I, OK. All right. What about um, Damien Demen? I've spoken with Damien because he put out a video about, I, I believe, and I'm trying to remember because it was a long time ago, about digital identity. So I spoke with him about that, but I, that's as far as I know him. I've never met him in person and never spoken to him. What did you think about identity. what he said in the documentary? Was that pretty out there too? I believe it was, but I can't remember his exact words. I didn't write them all down. I mean, again, I feel like this documentary was more of a, a witch hunt and a polarisation of people rather than trying to understand exactly what drove them to say those words to begin with. But you are telling me that there were views expressed, particularly violent views expressed, that you did not agree with in the documentary and that it in yeah, fact well, informed, you, informed you to some less than tasteful things that people had that you know had said yeah i mean people that i i've met very briefly in passing but there would be a lot of people that you've met sean that say some things you don't agree with in passing so again it's the it's character assassination and i think it's character assassination for me personally by trying to make me guilty by association with views that i've never personally expressed whatsoever but that just seems to categorize exactly how they see people that aren't agreeing with how the government has treated people that didn't want the vaccine over the last two years yeah did anyone from this documentary team ever approach you or ask you for an interview, Chantal? No, absolutely not. Although I did speak with the two older ladies that stuff interviewed. I actually met them up in Tauranga and they said to me that stuff had approached them and that they'd played this video of them um, and they were really worried that they were going to look terrible on it. And they said to me, they said, what do we do? What, what can we say? And I just said, well, you know, you, you've said what you've said. It's over now. But those same ladies, the stuff, di stuff didn't actually show what happened to them on the last day of the protest. So they are interviewed in my live stream on the last day absolutely distraught in tears, hugging each other and crying, surrounded by police because police had come down and stormed their tent and actually destroyed all of their belongings. So yeah, I feel like this they were there illegally. Because they were there illegally, Chantel, right? Well, no, not necessarily, because a yeah, lot of people are saying, well, but people have tried to say, yeah, I mean, 94% of everyone that has been arrested have been let off their charges. So the people that were actually progressed with their charges are people that had prior convictions. Mm. And most of them, it seems like, may have thrown something at police. So I don't actually know, and I'm yet to see anyone that has actually mm. been um, arrested and charged based on purely being in Parliament. Yeah, OK. There was also footage in the documentary of you appearing to join in what I'd call mob behaviour, telling people to leave or to get off public streets or to get out. What right do you or any other pro protester have to interfere with the lives of other New Zealanders? I'm sorry, what do you mean, leave well, and get off the street? Well, you're sitting there, remember there's uh, Paula being told to get out, you're in the background there filming. One of the women you talked about is saying, get out of here, you're not allowed here, we don't want you here, you're bent media. 
It was pretty aggressive. I mean, stuff. I never, I actually never, I never said to any media to get out. I was very clear. I actually went up to media on multiple occasions and asked them if they would like a hand interviewing people. If I can help them interview people that are that are balanced, that would be happy to talk with them to actually protect them. So I went up to media on multiple occasions because I wanted to make sure that they were actually safe once they were inside there. And even on the last day, I actually helped media away from the fires and helped ladies ex actually yeah. from stuff down off the benches that they were on. So I think. I think that's a bad character assassination that's completely false. All right, OK. I'm just saying what I saw in the documentary. Uh, do you still believe that police lit the fires? Because you said that, didn't you? <laughs> So that occasion, what had actually happened is I, when I'd first seen people light the fires, I said, oh, those people have lit them. And then other people came to me that were protesters and other independent media and said, no, no, no. I had met, like, what, what had actually happened is the police had run forward. They tipped over a gas canister that was inside one of the tents and then they pulled back. The fire started and it looked like the protesters. And so I was like, well, I must have been wrong because I thought what I saw was the protesters lit it. And they were saying, no, there was multiple fires. So there was a lot of conflicting information as soon as we discovered what had actually happened later on in the day, I rectified that. And as you would know through the Media Council guidelines, it's completely within what's appropriate when it comes to live streaming. It's very easy for things to get misconstrued. And as long as you make sure that you rectify that as soon as possible... Okay, so who do you say lit the fires and fueled the fires? Well... I would say that I would say the protesters now, knowing all the knowledge okay. that I have, and you have to. And do you, you think that was a good thing to do? Know. Do you think that was a good thing Absolutely to do? Absolutely not. Cool. Absolutely not. I yeah. mean, I think you can hear in my live streams that I pushed back and said the fires were a terrible thing. I actually ran in between police and the protesters when they first started trying to, when some of these bigger guys first started trying to throw wood towards them and tried to get them to stop, which wasn't my smartest moment. However, I could see that tensions were incredibly high. But what you have to remember is for, the, for three weeks, the police had used psychological torture tactics on these protesters every single mm. day. So they knew the reaction that they were going to get towards the end. But as you can, I don't know if you saw my live stream on that last day or not, but what I noticed were you had very two very clear lines of peaceful protesters that were holding the yeah. line and then the, and then the police. But then what you would have is you'd have people that would run up from behind, throw something over into the police and then run away. So then the police would be violent, thinking that these people that were holding the line had done it when it actually wasn't true. Yeah, well, I think everyone there had been given pretty good notice that it was time to leave and they'd made their point. Chantel, in the, in the um, Dominion Post this morning, Stuff have published a piece, and to be honest, it's another hit piece on you, really. But it says, um, Chantel Baker and Leighton Baker were particularly adept at managing their messaging to keep them within Facebook guidelines. Their posts mainly contained half-truths. Do you accept the criticism, and you've already said you got it wrong in terms of who lit the fires, that you have been guilty or might have been guilty of propagating fake news or things that are not true? Can you give me an instance where I've said something no, that you believe is not true? No, I can't give you an true? instance, and I'm waiting for stuff to give an instance. I'm asking but you whether... But this is, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So this is what I'm talking about. Well, there's about. an this instance that, the that, police, that police lit the fires. Okay, so if you can say that that is fake news because it's live streaming, then lo lots of media companies have done the same thing when you're live because you cannot control the full circumstances. It's not like a pre-recorded video. TV One put out the other day a big video on how the overturning of Roe vs Wade had stripped abortion rights from the United States. Now, that was a pre-recorded video that went through their entire And it was completely wrong, yeah. And it was completely false. So you could say that they're the false information because of that one instance. Or do you say, oh, they made a mistake, which they took three days to rectify. I rectified mine in, in a matter of hours. Now, what I've noticed with New Zealand media is that throughout this whole time, they've never actually stated anything that I've said outside of that one piece live at Parliament that I've said wrong. And they've never questioned me mm. on any of my narrative. Mm. The same with the disinformation project. So they've tried to lump categorise people together, but they don't give you instances. Well, they don't yeah, give well, you to be honest, they don't tell, give you trying, trying to get an interview with or some straight information out of the disinformation project has proved beyond me and my staff for the last couple of months. They simply will not engage in anyone who might challenge so, um, their woke views, to be honest. I went to see her speak, actually. I went down to the hey, and I found out she was talking. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep, I went down to see Kate Hannah speak and I sat at the front because I didn't want to, you know, hide or anything like that. And I heard her whole talk. And at the end, um, I they had a Q&A session and I actually got to ask her a few questions and she deflected. And then when the scientist who works with me went to ask a question, she ran out of the room. Yeah. So they're more than happy. Yeah, they bolted out of the room. I mean, she said things like um, far right extremist views like the nuclear family. Okay. So this woman is a radical extremist when it comes to her views of even what is considered centre for most people. I don't mm. think many people think well, that a family is a far-right... Well, what are your views, Chantel? Let's, let's find out if you're a Nazi <laughs> or not, shall we? Let's interrogate oh, that. Oh, gosh. OK, um, do you believe in the violent overthrow of the New Zealand government and in making New Zealand ungovernable? No, absolutely not. But I think what I think that stems from what that stems from for me with with the people that I've spoken with, is they think that the government is unfixable because they will not speak with them. But the and government that, that is fixable. You can vote to, it out, Chantel. I, I agree. I, I agree with you, Sean. I'm not trying to argue or debate that point. I agree with you. But for people, because the government have been silent when it comes to big topics and not allowing freedom of speech and not allowing discussion, and a prime example was over when they decided to bring in the mandates, they never actually had an open debate on TV with two scientists and doctors of differing viewpoints and actually had that argument. Yeah, so and the reason for that like would have been... The, the reason for that would have been we'd passed legislation in Parliament which gave our health authorities, under the circumstances, emergency powers where we didn't have to have the debate. And that was all done openly, and that legislation was pre-existing and voted on by representative parliaments, Chantel. So it wasn't like yeah, anyone abrogated <laughs> democracy. We actually had prepared for a pandemic, and we had prepared, been prepared to allow health officials to make decisions outside the democratic process. Yeah, they absolutely. And they were free to do that. And they did do that. And they exercised their right to do that. But what I'm saying is there is a lot of misconception around the science that was used. They never consulted with economists. A prime example is a study that was put out last year by a Wellington economist, Martin Lally. And he showed that if the quality of life dropped for people that decided not to get vaccinated from the mandates by 1% over five years, it's actually equivalent to around 46,000 deaths yeah. with the quality of life that dropped. So you've yeah. got so many extenuating circumstances that were not looked into and the science was not solid when it came to the mandates. We have OIAs that show that the government used the mandates. They said it wasn't just for public health. They wanted to encourage vaccination. So they were using this as a bullying and a manipulation tactic and it sat outside of the realm of health advice. All right. Uh, and fair enough. And you're allowed to have that view. Do you agree with violence at the protests or in any way to change a government's mind? Do you believe violence is justified in a functioning democracy by citizens who don't like what's happening to them? I mean, absolutely not. But as we've seen around the world, when uprisings happen, it is because government have made incredibly terrible decisions for a prolonged period of time. Now, I don't condone violence in any form. I've been very clear on that. But it does seem like stuff news does condone violence when it's relative to their narrative. They used a contributor by the name of Rangi Kamara, who was actually one of the four that was convicted of having firearms. Now, he was convicted, and the judge spoke at his conviction time about how they were trying to form a militia, and they did have violence violent intent towards members of the public He was one parliament. of those nutters in the two hoi raids, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so stuff have used him as a contributor. So you think that they do condone violence, but only when it perpetuates their narrative. All right. Um, are you anti-woman? Are you a misogynist? Or are you a stalking <laughs> horse for misogynist, which is what Fire and Fury seem to suggest, that all Nazis <sighs> and all fascists, they pick a nice woman who looks healthy, so that they can be anti-woman. That's all part of the uh, of the great conspiracy. Well, if you've watched any of my content, I think, you know, I'm a pretty strong-willed person. So anyone telling me to do anything, particularly put anything in my body that I'm not relatively comfortable with, will be unsuccessful. No, I'm very pro-woman. I'm so pro-woman that, in fact, I believe a woman is a woman and a biological man cannot be a woman. Now, that doesn't make me misogynist. I believe that trans people are trans, but I also do believe that a biological woman cannot become a man, a biological man cannot become a biological woman. It doesn't work. And so, and unfortunately, radical views are trying to tell us that biological men with all of their parts intact should be allowed to go into public pool 
schools get changed with little girls and we should just accept that. And I'm saying that we need a social line between what are we willing to accept as a society, what has gone too far and what do we need to have as our balance. All right. Um, so you're not into violence. You're not anti-woman. Are you racist? Are you racist <laughs> in any way? No. Okay. Oh, gosh. All right. I mean, Look, I'm just checking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I do actually appreciate you giving me the time to to quash any of these terrible, horrible rumours. No, the, the group at Parliament was the most diverse group of people that you'll ever meet. I mean, you had top businessmen from around Wellington, you had ex-members of Parliament, you had police, you had gang members, you had hippies, you had the Hare Krishnas, you had everyone. Yeah, we actually, surveyed, of we actually surveyed them, right? The platform surveyed them. Yes. We found there were more Green and Labour voters there than any other political party. Absolutely. And they were they were uh, predominantly not from major urban centres. They were New Zealanders from provincial or outlying uh, centres. Mm. Um, a lot of women there. But interestingly, too, a disproportionate number, the greatest disproportionality there was the number of Christian conservatives who were at the, pla at the protest. Are you a Christian conservative? <laughs> Absolutely. I believe in God and I do have some conservative values. I don't know if you could call me a full conservative because I think that range is very broad and it covers a lot of different areas that I do disagree with people on certain things. But absolutely, like the core of my values have been Christian and I'm so thankful for being raised in a strong family with strong values and good morals. I think it was fantastic for me and my brothers and sisters as an upbringing. All right. I want to just check off and I know you've answered some of these questions just quickly then. You have not been paid for or not received funding from any outside agencies, any foreign agencies for what you have been doing on social media. Definitely not. I think it's a narrative where, again, like saying that everyone at the protest yeah. is a far-right extremist or a Nazi, they say these things because they want to create a okay. disconnect and they don't want okay. to believe that the public are actually so upset at the government that they have self-funded people to yeah. try and create a change. Do you have formal or informal links with any particular political party uh, or lobby group no. in New Zealand or overseas? No, I've been approached by different groups, but I've got no connections with anyone. I've actually been very staunch in that, that I want to maintain my independence from any group, and that includes any freedom group, because I want to be free to share my own thoughts and my own opinions and not feel like I'm tied to anybody in any way. So, no, completely free, and it's been fantastic so far. All right. Do you consider that you have been defamed by the taxpayer-funded documentary Fire and Fury, and will you take any action as a result? We've definitely been defamed. We're talking with lawyers at the moment about the avenues that we can take, but again, that comes down to funding. We don't have large funders, we don't have large money behind us, so if the public come forward and they decide that they want to help us along that journey, that would definitely be appreciated. So you would consider that some of the stuff in this taxpayer-funded documentary is actionable? I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really make that justification. I'm just going to talk to lawyers and get their opinions on it. But it does seem to break multiple media council guidelines. So that's a discussion that we're having. OK, can I ask you too, um, I'm giving you the opportunity, uh, I'd love to see you sit down with Paula Penfold and have a conversation with her. I would love her that as well. So you're saying you would be happy to be interviewed by Paula Penfold or to answer her criticism? I'm saying I would love... Yeah. Yeah, I would love Paula Penfold to come on my podcast, actually, and we'll have a proper discussion because this is something that has been such a degradation of society here in New Zealand where we can no longer have constructive conversations with people that we disagree with. I mean, people are throwing out terms saying horrible things like anti-vaxxers to doctors that just disagree with this one potential medication and with unknown long-term side effects. I mean, these types of words are, are terrible. They're, they just tear society apart and they dehumanise people. And so I would love for her to yeah, come but on. there's a fair... Yep, come on, come, come on, Chantelle. I'm not going to yeah. let you get away with that entirely. The mood created amongst some in what I would call the anti-vax community, some of their language is pretty offensive, is pretty non-constructive and pretty challenging a as well. It's not like there's black and white here. There are grey areas all over the place. 
Well, I disagree with you to a certain point because when you look at the reach, I mean, we've had anti-vax thrown at anyone that disagrees with mandates, even if they're fully vaccinated, if they've got vaccinated, had a horrible injury, if they're medical doctors, if they're scientists. I mean, it's been a slanderous word that has been used nationwide. So now you cannot even have conversations with people because they just use a slur term. That doesn't happen. But you do way. understand so you that often people who are anti-vax also indulge in conspiracy theorism, right? But that doesn't give you a justification to slur them just because they have different opposing views to you. That well, doesn't often mean that their views, to be, I'm them. going to be brutally frank, often their views are crazy. Okay, but can I you mean, name like, like, I mean, like, like, I'm, I'm going well, to I'm, I'm do the nutter talk? test on you now. Oh, on you now, Chantel, because of, because of where our conversations got. No, to. no, I think. Do you I believe nine you know, eleven was an? Do you believe? Crazy. Just answer these questions, and we'll see if you're enough or not. Do you believe nine eleven was an inside no, job so or a I'm terrorist gonna, attack? I'm not going to go down, and I'm not. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be labelled in any way. I'm, I'm not, not trying go to label you. I'm trying to ask you a question. Yes, you, you. Well, you are, but I think that's a ridiculous line of questioning. But what I'm saying is that you've got to look at the proportionality of people. So you're saying that the, you're trying to say that the huge proportion of anybody that was against mandates are hardcore conspiracy theorists. No, that's I'm not sa I'm saying there are some of them. Some of them are. Well, yeah. but obviously, but you're going to have it. You're going to have that throughout a population. So even if they were against mandates, or sorry, even if they're pro mandates, you'd have a portion of those that are pro conspiracy theorists. I mean, that, that's a logical fallacy. All right. Okay, I'll take the uh, fluoride. You into fluoride and water or not? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, have some fun. He's digging, isn't he? He's got a spade and he's digging. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, do you think the vaccines were introduced globally as some sort of conspiracy to control people? Do you think the WHO has got some hidden agenda? Let's get to something I relevant. Think I think that they've used really flawed science and that's been brought up by a lot of scientists. I think that the science has been politicised and that rational thought hasn't been brought into the discussion and that's created conspiracy theories in itself. That is I mean, a very good answer, I have to say. Very good answer. Thank you. Yeah. But, I mean, we've seen that happen in New Zealand where so much policy was pushed through in the first lockdown that naturally it divides people and it makes them suspicious of motives. Mm, mm, absolutely. Chantel, what is next for Chantel Baker? Are you... Part or going to stand for parliament or council somewhere? What are your plans? I, ha I have no intention of being in parliament, listening to people argue all day with no constructive conversation. No, that's not my cup of tea. Um, we've got a lot of plans in place. We're releasing them slowly. When as you we say go, we, what, we do you, who do, what do you mean by we? Is that the royal? Yeah, so we? I've got a, I've got a small team. I've got a small team that I work with that are all volunteer at the moment. Um, but we will be looking for funding shortly when we release our new platform. So we've got a lot oh, of exciting things. Oh, what's your new platform? Store, what's your new platform? Oh, I can't. I can't say just yet. I'm not going to say until it's launched. Because I was going <laughs> to say, Chantel, do you want a weekly show on the platform? <laughs> well, possibly. Let's have a conversation about Let's it. Let's have a conversation about that. I would be happy to have you on board on the strength. Of, I think, the open conversation we have had today, um, I think it is greatly disappointing that those who made fire and fury with my tax dollar didn't come and talk to you because I think we would be having uh, nationally a more nuanced and a more constructive conversation than the prop propaganda they have created, seems to me, uh, is generating. Uh, I thank you for fronting and for answering my questions except about conspiracy theories and stuff. Absolutely right. <laughs> um, and look, let's keep in contact. And I'm serious about uh, about the show. I think um, people would be interested in hearing more from. All right. Me. I thank oh, you for thank your time. Thank you, Sean. I've re yeah, I really appreciate your time as well. Have a great show. All right. That is uh, Chantel Baker. Oh, sorry, she fronted. She answered. Didn't seem like a Nazi to me. I have to say.